Peter Thomas of PMC, how did you get started in audio? It started with my grandfather. He had an old wind-up gramophone, big pile of 78 RPM discs, and he gave them to me when I was about seven. And I just was fascinated that you could get sound out of this wind-up gramophone. And I think it really all rooted from there. I mean, I still collect 78s today, so that continues. I love uh, discs. Um, but, but mainly, I was fascinated by how the sound came out of that machine. And then I got into hi-fi by the time I got to my teens, started buying lots of uh, equipment, changing it. Uh, in those days, in, in Britain, there was a lot more DIY kind of uh, projects, so you could buy a pair of cabinets from a shop and buy the drive units and the foam. And what era, uh, years? Uh, 1969, 70, yeah. And uh, there was a big, there was two great big uh, streets in London where they had all this stuff and you could just put anything, to get anything together you wanted. So it was a fantastic time. Uh, and then I realised I wasn't very good at it and that I could buy stuff that was already designed and built. So I, I went through all sorts of different manufacturers' products and I eventually ended up with buying a pair of IMFs. Now IMFs were a company in Britain that made transmission line speakers. And there was something about those that I really loved and so I, I stuck with those for quite a few years. Um, and my closest friend, uh, who became my business partner later, he bought some as well. And we both loved these speakers. Um, but after a long, long time, we realised that perhaps there might be something new on the market. Um, so we went out to all the hi-fi stores and we borrowed loads of speakers and we put them up against these old transmission lines. And we thought, yeah, they're different, but we didn't think they were, you know what I mean, a huge jump that we thought that would have happened in, in, that, in that time. So we both started thinking, well, you know, I'd, I'd been doing a lot of work um, at the BBC at that time. You were already working at the by BBC? That, by that time, uh, yeah. I mean, it was in the late 70s I moved to the BBC. Yeah. And, you, and you started at the BBC as what? As an engineer, just a, an engineer that went around the studios repairing and servicing. Then I moved into project work and eventually I ended up running a whole section um, that looked after all the music studios. The, the lovely thing about the BBC was they trained you to do everything when you joined there. You went on like a six months training. They, they brought you in at degree level um, and then you went on all these training courses, which was fantastic because you learned about how microphones worked, how to repair them, all the way through to preamps, power amps, mixing desks, speakers, turntables, how to design a turntable, how to align it, all the curves and all the EQ in them. They did all that? They did, and tape machines, how to take them all apart, rebuild them, EQ them, calibrate them. I mean, it was really intensive but fantastic if you love audio and I mean I, lo I loved all that kind of stuff. So. And why did, why did they go that deep into the technical side? I mean they certainly had a, a you know a really high goal for excellence in audio. I mean they wanted the best possible and that was always their goal in, in engineering terms and you know early before I joined most of the equipment was designed and built by the BBC because they didn't feel companies outside the BBC could meet the, the challenge of the quality. Actually built by them, like yeah, their own designs. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, speakers tended to be licensed, so they would do the design and then they'd license them to companies like Rogers or people like that in those days to build the speakers. And that's how I kind of uh, got into speakers at the BBC as well as in my private life, because I became the representative for BBC Radio for listening to all these speakers that were being made under licence and we would do these huge listening tests to compare the original design with the production ones. And the best were creamed off and used at the BBC. And then a second layer would be sold to the public and the third were rejected. So I got into really intensive listening at that time. And their training, I mean, well, you've got to remember the BBC had been, you know, started in the early 30s and all these listening tests had evolved over this like previous 40 years. So they'd really got a great balance between listening and measuring. And I still use that today with, with developing PMC speakers. Did they do a lot of research work into loudspeaker design? They did a huge, sort of huge amount of papers. Um, and of course, the, the, probably the most well-known one in, is the LS35A, which was the little mini monitor. And that was the first small speaker that actually had a reasonably wide frequency response. So they were very, very intensive. And I suppose because they were non-commercial, they could afford to explore things that a commercial company couldn't have at that time. Um, so yeah, remarkable designs and, and the listening was quite intense. A lot of it was done with a speech recording and it's quite interesting, speech is the most difficult thing to reproduce accurately and because we listen to speech every day of our lives, we recalibrate our ears every second to what does real speech sound like. So if you think about it logically, using speech to design a speaker is actually quite sensible because our brains are so focused in on it. So even today, we, when we design a speaker, we'll use speech for 
70% of the development. I've always thought, and see if you think this is true, that people will say, oh, you need special ears to be an audiophile. And I said, no, everybody no. knows what a voice sounds like. Absolutely, yeah. We, you know, and, and people say we all listen differently. Well, even say we were listening slightly differently, we can't tell what uh, each individual's brain is hearing, but they know what sounds natural to them. So we are all experts in audio. There's, there, there aren't, I don't believe in golden ears. I believe that we're all capable of golden ears. The only difference is you train yourself to focus. You know, if you're listening to a piece of music, you can focus on one element of it, which that may take training for some people. Other people, I think it comes naturally, but we're all, we've all got great, great ears. Um, so no, I don't believe in a golden ears philosophy. Tell us more about what you did at the BBC and also what you learned at the BBC with what you did, where it culminated. Yeah, um, I mean, the, the first few years was really working in all the different departments. So you worked in drama and you worked in speech studios, but my love was music. Um, most of the music was recorded for Radio 1, Radio 2, which are the rock pop channels, and Radio 3, which was classical music, were done at Maida Vale Studios, which is north northwest London. Um, and that's where I ended up looking after those studios. Um, I think what really grounds you is be able to hear real instruments, real music, and then listen to its reproduction, and you realise what a long way of, you know we've got to go. I mean, even today, you know, it's you know you go and listen to a drum kit, and you walk into the other room with the speakers, and although it's closer, still a long way to go. You know, it's incredible listening. What's missing? Um, dynamic range, uh, textures, and details. Still more. You know, it's all that that fine detail. I mean. By the time we got to the 70s, we got frequency response sorted out. You know, we could produce low frequencies, high frequencies. So that wasn't the issue, and that was the big variable back then. These days, it's very much detail, texture, um, and distortion. I mean, detail and texture usually goes hand in hand with distortion, and speakers have still got quite a high amount of distortion. So if we can just strip that down, and that's been our goal for the last 30 years at PMC, you know, it's just trying to take those layers off of, of distortion. Um, that, that's where the real advances are. And of course they're the hard ones to solve. Um, they're, they're, they're the challenging ones now. I wish I was back in the 70s because it was easy then, because you, <laughs> you, know, you, could, you could make big changes back then, I think. Uh, no. So during this time at the BBC, were you still designing speakers on your own? Yes, yeah. What, uh, I, I suppose what happened for me was there was a parallel life at, at home. I was interested in developing a speaker for, for my own use with my my good friend Adrian, and um, we want to design these speakers for our own hi-fi use because, as I think I said earlier, we listened to all these alternative speakers from other manufacturers and we didn't think they offered a great deal of improvement. And by that time, transmission lines had started to disappear. They had their problems back in the 70s, and uh, so they went a bit out of fashion. But we wanted to explore that, so we started doing that in our own time. And what do you mean exactly by a transmission line? A transmission line is, is a much more complex way of producing bass, uh, but it, it has a lot of advances and a lot of um, uh, advantages over other, other methods. The only problem is it's quite complex, and if you get it wrong, it really does sound quite terrible. Um, and that was one of the problems. A lot of early transmission lines had a lot of problems. Basically, uh, in, in most speakers, the, the cabinet is almost empty. It's just filled with absorbent foam, and the drive unit just vibrates against the air inside that that cabinet and then you've got reflex kind of uh, speakers which obviously have a port and you use the port to add to the base of the of the drive unit but only really controls it at certain frequencies transmission line the transmission line actually acts like another base unit it's a long tunnel inside the cabinet behind the drive unit the lovely thing about that is is it's kind of two base loading principles in one um, at the upper base it absorbs all the radiation from the drive unit um, going into the cabinet and so that gives you quite low distortion and, and gives you a nice clean upper base. As you go down in frequency the, this long tunnel lined with the absorbent material now starts to act as another drive unit and allows the base to come out the vent at the bottom of the cabinet and this almost doubles the effective um, area of the drive unit so you end up with a much higher level capability than an equivalent cabinet. Now it's quite a complex problem in terms of crossing over from that upper base absorption to producing the base from the vent. And that's where probably the old designs, they weren't very sophisticated. But we've spent you know, a long time um, perfecting that technique so that we can get quite a low frequency and a loud low frequency from 
a smaller cabinet. And of course in the home, that's what most people want. The days of having a giant sort of fridge in your front room, <laughs> you know, is kind of gone. You know, people want something more elegant and, uh, and you know, not so dominating in the room. I mean, we still make huge speakers. I mean, the lovely thing about transmission is you make a big speaker and it goes even lower and, and, and more powerful. And of course, for our studio work, that's really important. But, you know, it, 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 it's a fascinating loading principle because every year at PMC, we're improving it. And the real attraction for me is distortion. It's one of the ways of reducing that distortion I mentioned earlier, getting it down so that we can hear more detail, not only in the bass, but also in the mid-range. What's the, one of the interesting things I found years ago that I used to really love electrostatic speakers. And everyone used to say, you know, it's because of the electrostatic principle in the mid-range. And actually, when you analyze it, it's because the distortion from the bass in an electrostatic is really low. And it doesn't ricochet up into the mid-range. And that's what masks the mid-range. If you can reduce the distortion in the low frequencies, then the mid-range starts to, to spread its wings. And transmission lines, that's what I realised why I like transmission lines, because that low distortion in the bass allowed the mid to, to produce that lovely three-dimensional image. I didn't know that at the beginning, uh, you know, that I'd just use these, uh, but our research into that has shown that that's the reason why I was attracted to these two very different types of speaker, but they had that in common. That in common. Yeah. So you had this parallel life of, of designing home speakers still, or speakers yeah. in your home. Yeah. And how did that transition from the BBC into what's become PMC? Yeah, well, the, the BBC had a bit of a problem because they designed their own speakers, as I, as I said. They, they designed speakers up to about that kind of volume, reasonable medium volume speakers. Now, in the music studios, they needed monitors that produce really high levels. Um, and so they had to go to companies like JBL, Tannoy, some of the, the pro companies, because they were the only speakers that would be bulletproof. The trouble with that is, is their sonic characteristics were completely different to the BBC monitors. And so the BBC had this dilemma really because it was out of their comfort zone to use those. And so they approached a lot of companies while I was, I mean, I was working there and I was helping get these other companies' products in. Um, and we were evaluating all these different brands to see if we could get something similar. Uh, and we had a few attempts and that didn't work. And then some, one of the guys that I was working with, one of the, the engineers who Record, recorded there, he said, you're, you're doing a lot of speaker work, why don't, you, why don't you just produce a prototype? So I spoke to Adrian, my, my, my future business partner, and said, you know, shall we do it? So instead of, ironically, instead of designing a speaker for our, our hi-fi, which is what we wanted to do, we then started building these monster great cabinets to go into a studio. So that's how it began. Um, that was about three or four years before I left um, the BBC and so and these designs went into the studio. They did. Uh, we did five versions. We did. We called them BB one to five. And we, what, what the great thing about the BBC is you put a pair of prototypes in. This is how the BBC always did it. And a book went in on the desk, and every operator who went in there wrote comments about the the, the trial monitors. And because the BBC was a very fast turnover museum, it wasn't like somebody booked the studio for a month. You know, they'd do four four numbers in five hours, and then the next guy would come in. It would it was pretty intensive in those studios. So you get loads of guys writing their comments. And I mean, I always remember, I think I've still got them somewhere. On the first prototypes, I think somebody said, get them out of here, they're awful. And they were really, I mean, they're very, very strong comments. I right. mean, they're really high-end guys. But what a great way to expose them to people with the best. And get feedback you know, directly. Best. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we went through one, two, three, and when we got to the fifth version, over a period of about a year and a half, um, they all said, great, we love these. We want them. And the problem there is the BBC is funded by a license fee in Britain, and I couldn't be seen to be working at the BBC and benefiting from it and working there. So I was basically given an ultimatum. You either leave and we buy them, or you stay and we, we take your design. So I left. Okay, uh, was that a hard decision? Uh, yeah, well, I, it was really, because I, I loved the BBC. I loved, you know, it was a amazing place to work, all the training you got, you know, and, and it was a great group of people. Uh, it was like leaving the womb almost because it was such a, a big organisation. You were, and suddenly you're on your own, you know, yeah. and, and you're only as good as the, the, the speaker you've got. And we only had one product. And what that was yeah. called at that point? That was the BB5. That that's, was the BB5. That's, that's a big, big monitor. And that still. was the first PMC product as well? It was, although ironically, at the same time, uh, I, I, 
what the lovely thing about working the BBC was, that although I was involved with speakers, you, you got involved in every aspect of other you know, turntables and tape decks. And while I was just leaving, I'd been working on developing a, speak, a, a turntable to play their 78s on. They wanted to transfer all their 78s to, to uh, well, back then I think it was some very early digital format. Um, and the problem was um, they didn't really have anyone that was that interested in it. And they knew I was a 78 collector. Mm -hmm. And they said, you're, you're into this, why don't you do it? So I did, with my team, designed a 78 player and I left in the middle of it. So they approached PMC and said, we need 10 of these. Can you build 10 of these for us? So actually, one of the first PMC products was a turntable oh, really? for 78s, uh, only just for the BBC. Yep, yep. And we built those for them. But yeah, so the BB5 was the first real PMC speaker. Yep. Um, and then, of course, you suddenly, when you leave and you start a business, you have to go into quite a steep learning curve. Yep. Um, we'd never done it before. Um, How did the name come, PMC? Um, we, we felt that we were in the professional world. Um, we were building monitors. And we're quite simplistic kind of people, so we got the <laughs> professional monitor company. That, yeah. that kind of works. And then obviously that's quite a mouthful, so it became PMC. We were surprised nobody else had called themselves that actually, because it's a, a natural thing in the pro world. Um, so that kind of worked well. Um, and I think, you know, we obviously realised we only had one product, so I immediately started working on the smallest product. Um, so I, I designed the small, I wanted to see whether we could make a transmission line in a, in a small cabinet. I mean, it's about that, that, that big. Um, and we did. And that was the first transmission line that wasn't an enormous great speaker. And what was that one called? That was called the LB1. Now, this numbering system was quite simplistic as well back then. B BB was big box and oh, LB box. was little box. You yeah, know? yeah, I mean, yeah. That's, that's how sophisticated we were. <laughs> <laughs> um, and but these it, were powered, fully powered speakers? No, right? no, nope. the, no. The, BB, the, BB, the, BB, the BB5s were powered. Um, they had separate big banks. They were active, the big, yep. big system. So dry, each drive unit had a power amp. Uh, and we actually developed our own power amps with Quad. We went to Quad and licensed mm -hmm. some of their circuits. And we built these huge, uh, you know, 600 watt power amps. That was the other problem back in the late 80s: is that there weren't any very high powered power amps that were actually what I would call hi-fi amps. They were PA amps. They were they were brutal and they sounded hard and yeah, there were no no delicacy to them. Yeah. So that was the other challenge we had to do. We had to develop a five 600 watt amp, which doesn't sound a lot today, but back then that was big know, power. Big power. And, 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 you know, to get the, the, the performance from the speakers. So that was, that was quite a challenge. But then, you know, the LB ones were passive. And we slowly got into hi-fi through that product. Um, although we made it as a little speaker for little studios, uh, we started picking up hi-fi dealers that wanted to um, sell them. So then is that how the transition, because PMC obviously started as a pro company. We did, yeah. And so how many years before it transitioned into becoming a hi-fi company? Yeah, well, it was very quick. But the, I mean, the LB1 came out within a year of the BB5, and we, were, we, we had a, a, a small group of dealers in the UK selling those already. But, I mean, the proportion of sales was very small. It didn't really, I suppose, when consumer really became dominant in our business was the late, late 90s. Uh, by the time we got to about 98, 99, we started then focusing on developing a product dedicated to the home. All our speakers we made could be used at the home or the studio. We, we voiced them the same. We had the same goals. We didn't change that. Do you have a preference for pro or for hi-fi, like our home hi-fi? In terms of what the Your own interest. Or, oh, it's a difficult one, that really, because I mean, my work's been a lot of pro in broadcast, and then my home life, I love both, really. And I think it's important that we, uh, the company has that interest in both because you learn from both industries, you know. Uh, we're it's amazing how separate the two industries are, really. I mean, when, when you think it's all about audio, and yet you, they never talk to each other. So one of the things we try and do is bring uh, distributors and dealers in and go and visit studios uh, in the hi-fi world so they can see how it's, how it's done. Because I and find it's still like that. Like, it, it was is. like that then. It's, it's weird, it's, isn't it? It's very similar but very separate worlds. It, it is. And, I, and the funny thing is, I think both sides have a slightly suspicious view of each other as well because... Um, the pro world is very much a, it's a business, you know, it's business to business kind of thing. It's, it's their career. It's not necessarily their love. So mm -hmm. you, you have a, a mix of different types of people. Um, and in consumer, obviously most people love it, but they don't have, it's not a business for them. It's a, it's, it's an interest. So they're coming from a different 
place really I think and that's why perhaps there's a but it's but you learn so much from from each other yeah um, I went to a, 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 I don't know where it was I think it was a CES show many years ago and we were on a stand next to a guy who was selling all kind of tweaky it was a hi-fi show yeah, yeah. tweaky tweaky stuff you know little things you stuck on your CD player and he had these green little green discs you know mm -hmm. I remember and, those yeah <laughs> and and uh, he said go, go and try this this one we're all CD based and, and he said try that and I said no no I, I've tried those piggyback CDs and they yeah and he said no go on try it so I said yeah okay then so I walked in next door and we had a like somebody had loaned us a really superb CD player for the show I can't remember what make it was I think it was audio research or something and we always then used to burn our own CDRs with all the tracks we wanted to play mm -hmm. for an hour and then you know we knew that any track would sound great um, so I just pressed the eject button threw the disc on closed the drawer and we all went back to, so it was quiet, it was on Sunday morning, I think, and we yeah. all went back to talking to each other. And the first track came on, and we all went, turned to the speakers, and went, does that sound different to you? I went, took it out, put it back, put it, and this thing was amazing. I mean, the detail that it added and the space it added. I mean, this was on a 5,000 pound CD play, it wasn't mm -hmm. it? Um, anyway, I went back to the guy and said, how does this work? He said, I don't know. <laughs> he said, that happens a he lot. Said, he said, I've sprayed this disc multiple different colours and I know that that colour green sounds better. Why? I don't know. And it had little triangles cut out in it, little shapes. Yeah. I said, what are the triangles? And he went, I don't know. He said, I just know that that pattern and those triangles sound better. Yeah, yeah. He was very really honest. I mean, yeah, he wasn't yeah. trying to... At least he was, no. But, but it worked. And yeah. I love that. Now, yeah. what I was telling you that was I went to a recording studio in London the week after I said, guys, I've got something to show you. I didn't show them what it was. So I said, have you got a CD you like? And they had these big professional studio CD players. And uh, so this guy had a Doobie Brothers CD from the 70s, put that on, played it without it. And I said, right, don't look. And I put the disc in, played it. And I had three, I had three mastering engineers. Mastering engineers, if you don't know, are the guys that do the final EQ and balance of a, an album before it goes out. And all these guys use PMCs, which was great. And I got them in there, and, uh, and I put the green disc in, press play, and both of them went, what in God's name have you done? And I, yeah. and I said, I'm not telling you. And they went, wow, that's amazing. And I took it out without them seeing, and they went, yeah, it's gone back. And I took it out and showed it to them. One of them left the room. He said, he said that's ruined my life. And they, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so yeah. I think that kind of shows you that you know, the, 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 the things you can learn from one industry and show these other guys. But it opened their eyes, I think, to the fact that you know, with digital mediums, you've got to be so careful with, with not losing that depth, width and height. That is the Achilles heel. Of, of digital. Do you believe so? Yeah. yeah. It, it, it's the thing that's so easy to lose, both in the converters, in the cabling, everything. Do you have a preference, analog or digital, or what's your feeling on that? Um, well, I, I am a big analog person. I love discs, so that's why I, I still like vinyl a great deal. I just love the texture and the depth, width and height. The, the great You're thing talking I, sonically, yes, the actual sound yeah, that comes and from I vinyl. Like, I like the whole ritual of, of playing the album, and I, I like listening to a whole album rather than jumping around tracks, but ultimately, you know, a high resolution digital system beats it hand down, should do. Should. Yeah. Yep. But uh, I think most of us haven't experienced that. When you hear in a studio, a really high end digital recording, it's amazing, you know. But even then, you know, a vinyl cut at high speed can sound very, very close. Uh, some of the studios we've done have done comparisons where they've direct cut a 45 RPM vinyl disc and, uh, and recorded it on 24 or 48 bit, 96K or even higher, and compared them. And uh, you know, you can get pretty close, which is amazing when you think there's just a little bit of diamond vibrating in a bit of plastic. I mean, it, yeah. it, if, if you tried to sell that idea today, nobody would believe it. It's amazing that, that, that it work. works, actually. It is incredible, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. The thing that I love about analog is, you know, it's got noise problems, it's, you know, distortion, end of side vinyl problems all those things, but you never lose that depth, width, height, and texture that vinyl and that analog has. And that is the thing that you can easily lose digitally. Um, you know, if you have poor D2A converters or, you know, poor cabling, you can start to shut that down and that, that width, depth, and height gets very, very small. Um, the trouble we have is we don't have a measurement for it. We right. Don't, we don't have, you know. We quantify it. No, all the measurements we have are analog. They're all the weaknesses in analog measurements, you know, noise. No problem with noise with digital frequency response. 
no problem with frequency response with digital. They're easy. But why, do, why bother to measure them, really? Because we know it's going to be, you know, it, it's that depth, width and height stuff that we haven't got a measurement for. Well, we've got these. Right, right. <laughs> we've got our ears, but that, you know, and that's what's fascinating. There is still work going on trying to work that out. But the interesting thing, I think, in the pro world is that they very, feel very much that digital is perfect. There's that, still that element of it. And I think that's quite dangerous because nothing's perfect. And, uh, you know, that you won't enhance the, or progress it if you think like that. Yeah. And this chasing bigger numbers is also a big factor. In Higher that. sampling rates. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, going back to my BBC days, they used to transmit all the radio channels from 1972 via a 13-bit, 32 kilohertz system. They distributed it around the UK. So 32-bit, uh, 32 kilohertz, so 15K bandwidth, and nobody ever, ever noticed that it was digital. 13-bit, yeah. 32 kilohertz. Yeah. So pretty, you know, much lower than... CD, yeah. nobody ever noticed that it was digital. And I think the reason for that was, was the D to A converters and A to D converters occupied two bays that were like 10 foot tall. Yeah. And every day you had to go in there and tweak and calibrate, calibrate them, them perfectly. Because they would, they drift and everything. But I think because they were so accurate that the 13 bit 32K worked. Yeah. So that kind of proves that maybe the, 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 the chasing the big number is not the whole reason. Story. It probably makes it easier to, if you make poor D to A converters for them to sound better. But so you went from BBC corporate employee, yeah, to an entrepreneur. We Were did. there any regrets along the way? Did you think, oh, I make uh, no PMC is obviously successful today, yeah, but yeah. along the way, no, no, I loved it. I just loved it from day one. Really, I mean, yes, you've got the stresses of paying the bills and selling enough product and marketing and and you've got to learn a lot of new skills really quickly um, and uh, but I, yeah we loved it it was it was great fun and so let's say somebody forgetting the time period and whether it could be as, as successful today let's say somebody does say I want to to be a speaker manufacturer yeah. what do you know now yeah from being in compared to being a new speaker manufacturer what could you tell somebody uh, get a good accountant <laughs> <laughs> really right, right from day one yeah yeah, we got through about four before we found a really great one. And yeah. what did that do? What did that do? I, I, it gave you uh, a good framework of ensuring that you know you looked after your money, and they also looked after make sure you didn't pay too much tax. And that's quite important at the beginning because you want every halfpenny you can you can find to to fund your business. But no, I, I say that a bit lightheartedly. But to be honest, that would be on my list. Of, yeah, of, yeah. Of, um, How I, about the approach to products? Approach to products, yeah, I mean, we were, we, I'd love to say we had a really great plan about that, but we didn't. We really busked it. We really did it on the, on the fly. We didn't, we didn't plan that. And I think that would be certainly something that I would advise someone to really, really get a business plan together on what are you going to, what are you going to launch? What order are you going to do it in? Um, you've really got to get under the skin of the profitability of each product. Sadly, there's a lot of business in, 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 in obviously, in any business. Uh, I think a lot of companies start up because of the passion and the love for it, but ultimately it has to make some money. Um, and you, you, you know, and also if you're thinking of exporting to other countries, you've got to work out your whole pricing structure for all that. So you want, you want a bit of business advice from someone. There, there are quite a few networks in Britain and, and, and in North America, I know, where other um, businesses get together and meet and exchange ideas. And that would be something I would really recommend to somebody from day one. If you can find other people, you know, you know not, it doesn't have to be the same business because they're the same issues you have whether you're making donuts or speakers, really. They're, they're the same, same organizational yeah. skills. You know, you've got to sell them and buy yeah. the bits in. And so that's what I'd say. If you could get into one of those groups, and there's quite a few now, uh, you really get great advice because if you're at the top of a business and, and you haven't got anybody to ask, you can get a bit lonely. So, you know, you want someone to share yeah. those, those questions with. Now, how about the product vision itself? Now, PMC has a distinctive look. It doesn't look like you've sold out the product at all. No, no. I suppose we, I mean, we look at what's happening in the marketplace. Uh, I mean, style, I mean, if we look at just the look of the product, that evolves over the years. But equally, we want to keep our core look. I mean, one of the things about ASB is because we use transmission lines, there is a, these large vents on the front. Um, so they, keep, they tend to dominate the, the, the look of the product. And, and of course, over the last few years, we've introduced laminaire, which is this um, technique of improving the flow of air through the vent. That's, that's become a feature now of the product. But there's always been that on, you know, in terms of the, the visual design of the product. 
So we, we've moved the design, you know, the look of the product on over the years, but it still has our, our core values. What we don't want to do is, is affect the performance because of how it looks. You know, we're very, very focused on improving the sonic capability of our products year on year. That, I mean, that's our, our major goal. Um, and, you know, obviously they've still got to look nice, but, but that's our focus. Yeah, and so you're obviously, PMC is its own entity, but since you're one of the founders, it's synonymous, Peter Thomas yeah. and PMC. How would you, from the people looking in from the outside, how do you want to be perceived with your company, now and in the future? How would I want to be perceived? Um, what I'd, do you want I'd, people to see? Uh, I'd want to see, from the company point of view, a, a great product that produces great sound so that people can enjoy their music more. But to me, it all started with me listening to music and wanting to listen in the best possible quality so I can enjoy my music. And that's what I think, that's me and that's the product, you know. I'd rather people spend money on more records than keep having to keep changing their hi-fi, you know. So to me, it's all about the music. And I think that also goes hand in hand with the pro side because that's all about the music and capturing that music. And I think if you can reproduce that music more and more accurately, it also drives the recording industry to record at a better quality. I mean, in 100 years' time, we're going to be able to play back these recordings that we're making today in way better quality than we're listening to now. And we just want to make sure we're capturing it now in that quality. And if we don't know that, um, you know, we might not do that and we won't enjoy it. The, the, the generations ahead of us won't be able to enjoy it. Okay, thank you, Peter. Okay.